All right, here are solutions to the practice quiz that we have, quiz eight, I guess, for Math 111. Uh, what's going on on this quiz is we're gonna deal with polynomials. For the first half of the quiz, you're given the equation of a polynomial and asked a bunch of questions that eventually will get you an approximation of the graph, I guess, as good as you can do without calculus informally. Uh, and then on the back page, you're given the graph of a polynomial and you ask for the equation of that polynomial. So that'll be the plan for this quiz. So starting from the start, we're given this equation here and we're asked what the degree of the polynomial is. And what a degree of a polynomial is, is it's just the largest exponent that you see when the polynomial is written in its standard form. This was not written in its standard form, this is written in the factored form. So you have to kind of think about what would this look like if it were foiled out, informally speaking. Uh, so if you were gonna take this x plus one and multiply it by itself, x squared plus two x plus one, and then take that and multiply it by x minus two cubed, that'd be a mess. But eventually if you combined all the terms, what you'd end up with as your leading coefficient, would be negative two from this negative two here, and then x raised up to the sixth power. That's six coming from this two, plus three more, plus one more. There's this implied one on this factor. Now it looks like an exclamation point. Um, what I'm saying is that if you were to expand this polynomial all out, its leading term would be negative two x to the sixth power. And so what that tells you is that the degree of the polynomial is just six. Uh, what about end behavior? Well, if you have this leading term right here, you can determine its end behavior. The way we write end behavior in our class is kind of as a mathematical sentence. We talk about what happens when x goes to infinity. What does that do to the y or the f of x value? And then we talk about as x goes to negative infinity. Informally, when you go way out to the right of the graph, does it go up or down? When you go way out to the left of the graph, does it go up or down? You can answer those questions just by looking at the leading term of your polynomial, this negative 2x to the sixth. And as we saw in class, anytime the leading coefficient here, the negative 2, is a negative number, it means you're going to put a negative number right up here in your top row. It's negative infinity. Had this been positive 2x to the sixth, this would have been a positive infinity, but it's not, so it's not. And then the second row, the, the lots of ways you can figure it out the way I taught you in class, is that if this is an even number up here, if the degree of the polynomial is even, so six in this case is even, then what you write in the second line is the exact same as what you wrote in the first line. So since I wrote negative infinity in the first line, I'm gonna write negative infinity again in the second line. Had this been odd, if it were a seventh degree polynomial, and my leading coefficient were still negative, I put the negative here, and then this would have became positive. But it's not, so it's not. Uh, all right, y-intercept. The y-intercept is just asking you the question, what is the height, what is the output of this polynomial? when it's crossing the y-axis. And the important thing to know about the y-axis is it's not to the left of your graph, not to the right of your graph, it's kind of right in the middle. It's where the x value equals zero. So really this is just asking you what comes out of this machine, this function, when you put zero into it. And that ends up being the constant term when you have your polynomial written in its standard form. So if you expanded it all out, if you had these dot, dot, dots, and then the last term, you can figure out what that would be equal to. Um, but maybe it's easier to just take our factored form and change all the x's into zeros. We would get negative two times, let's see, zero plus one is just one. So one squared, and yeah, no, that's just one. And then from the next term, we'd get zero minus two, the next factor, I guess, and that would be cubed. And then zero plus four is just four to the first power, you don't have to write it. And you multiply these guys all out. Um, that's one, that's negative eight, and that's four. So this negative two and this four gives me negative eight and negative two cubed gives me negative eight, and negative eight times negative eight gives me positive 64. So if you wanna just say the y-intercept is at 64, that's fine, or if you felt like it, you could say it's x-coordinate is zero, and it's y-coordinate is 64. Either way is totally good. About the x-intercepts, well here is where um, we finally see some benefit for not being given the standard form and instead being given the factored form, because it makes it much easier to find the x-intercepts. The x intercepts are just the solutions to the equation f of x equals zero. It's asking you the question, when does zero come out of this machine? Right, when are we crossing the x-axis? Well, you're crossing the x-axis if the height is zero. The height is the output, the f of x value. So if f of x equals zero, you got an x-intercept. So where does f of x equals zero? Well, just by inspection, we can see that if x were negative one, negative one plus one is zero, and zero times whatever the hell else this stuff gives me, it's still zero. So if x equals negative one, I got an x-intercept. So I don't know, maybe I'll write them out here. x equals negative one would be one x-intercept. Uh, positive two and negative four would also work by kind of the same logic. 
sort of a weird order to write these in, but that's the order that my factors appeared. So that's the order that I wrote the x-intercepts. Note that this doesn't create an x-intercept because there's nothing you can change the x's into to make this negative 2 a 0. This is always a negative 2. It's just these factors here that can produce zeros. If this were negative 2x, for example, then 0 would be an x-intercept, but it's not, so it's not. Um, this also asks, whoops, to state the multiplicity of each of these roots. So maybe I'll just write that down below. The reason it asks that is that's going to manifest itself in the graph, which is what we're doing in part E. The multiplicity of a root, all that's saying is each of those roots have a factor that corresponds with them, right? The negative one came from this factor here. What power is that factor raised up to? Well, it's two in this case. So that negative one root has a multiplicity of two. So this multiplicity is just two. And similarly, the multiplicity of the root at two is three. And the multiplicity of the root of negative four is one. So I can put in a three here and a one here, maybe some arrows to make it clear what I'm talking about. Those are the multiplicities of my different roots, AKA X intercepts. Sure. And then with that information, we can sketch a graph. So what I like to do is kind of start by labeling the X values. I got X equals negative one on my graph. I got X equals positive two on my graph and I got X equals negative four on my graph. And then for the Y intercept, we said that the Y intercept was at 64. So roughly here. Oh, and then I better make sure I have the right end behavior as well. It's supposed to go down when I go to the right, and it's supposed to go down when I go to the left. So it's going to kind of shoot off in this direction. Uh, so you're like, all right, so I just kind of connect the dots. Ooh, that's going to get kind of weird, right? If I'm starting from down here and sort of connecting the dots, how am I going to get that x-intercept? Sorry, y-intercept. Well, the way you can get it is you have to make sure that you exhibit the multiplicities. And all that's saying is if the multiplicity is even, you're going to bounce off the graph at that point. If the multiplicity is odd, you're going to go right through the graph at that point. And yeah, I guess there's technically a little bit more to it. If it's odd and it's the number one, really that's where you go right through. Or if it's odd, but it's a number greater than one, like three for example, it kind of flattens off as it goes through. What am I talking about? Let me show you. This one has multiplicity one. So when I draw my graph, it's just going to go right through that point, something like that. And then I'll go up for a while. I don't know where I turn around because I haven't taken calculus yet. And calculus, you'll figure out the height here. So that's why this is so approximate. Ends up being a lot higher than 90, but that's fine. Doesn't matter. Uh, and the next thing that's important is that I go through the x-axis. Or I go through this point, this x-intercept at negative 1, this guy right here. But note that since its multiplicity is 2, what I want to have happen is I want my graph to kind of bounce off at this point. So it looks something like that. And get up through this y intercept. So I've got everything so far so good. Um, the last root that I have to make sure the last x intercept is at 2. And recall that 2 has a multiplicity of 3. So I'm going to cross through the axis at that point. But I'm not going to do it in the same way I cross through at negative 4. I'm going to kind of flatten out as I cross through. So maybe this over exaggerates the effect. But it gives you the idea of what these graphs look like. It kind of flattens out like that and then continues going down. Note that this graph has the correct end behavior, the correct y-intercept, the correct x-intercepts, and the correct mul multiplicity at each of those intercepts. Um, so this is my approximate graph. So you're saying this is what the graph of that function looks like? No, I'm, that's not exactly what it looks like. Um, I graphed it with a different program. This is what it looks like. All right, note that in between my roots at negative 4 and negative 1, <clears throat> well, I have to go up super high. I didn't mean to zoom in there. to see where this turns around. All right, apparently I'm not capable of doing that with this pen. I can do it with my mouse. All right, we go way up here to 1100 before it turns around. That's the kind of thing that you can figure out when you take a calculus class. We're not so worried about that. All we notice is that we have these intercepts at negative four, negative one, and positive two. At negative four, the graph goes right through the axis. At negative one, the graph bounces off the axis. And then at positive 2, I can see that a little bit better, it flattens off as it goes through. Oh, and there's also this y-intercept right here. I think we calculated that to be equal to 64, and this graphing program confirms that that is, in fact, the y-intercept. So we don't get an exact graph when we sketch it over here, but for our purposes, it's good enough. I don't know where the graph turns around here. I didn't know where it turns around over here. It's all stuff we'll figure out in calculus. But for pre-calc, we'll call that good enough. Um, but there's a second problem on this quiz. 
And on this second problem, what's going on is they give you the graph. They tell you it's a six degree polynomial and they tell you the y-intercept. So I guess I can put that into the picture. This right here is supposed to be at 36. And as I can kind of see here, it's got an x-intercept at negative two. It's got an x-intercept at negative one and it's got an x-intercept at positive three. So maybe I'll list those below. My x-intercepts, I have negative two, negative one, and positive three. What about the multiplicities of those x-intercepts, the multiplicities of those roots? Well, at three, it bounced off. The graph bounced here. So it must be an even number. Well, which even number? A two or four, six, eight? Well, it can't be bigger than two, it'll turn out. And that's because it's a six degree polynomial. So the sum of the multiplicities, when I add those up, they have to give me six. And I'm going to use up three of them at negative one here, as we'll see in a minute. So the multiplicity of the root at three, all we can tell is it's even from looking at the graph, it's going to end up having to be two. Why two? Well, the root at negative two has to have a multiplicity of one because my graph goes right through at that point. But at negative one, the graph crosses the x-axis but it flattens out as it does so. And so what that tells me is that it's an odd number, but it's greater than one. So odd number greater than one, three, five, seven, well, it has to be the smallest, that three, because otherwise the sum of these multiplicities would exceed six. All right, this is as small as it could be, this is as small as it could be, and I'm already getting a six degree polynomial. So what I'm saying is my polynomial, well, if it has an x-intercept at two, it has a factor of x plus two, if the multiplicity of the root at negative two is one, that x plus two is raised up to the first power. If it has an x-intercept at negative one, it must have a factor at x plus one. If the multiplicity of that x-intercept is three, that x plus one factor is raised up to the third power. If it has an x-intercept at three, x minus three must be a factor. And because the multiplicity is two, it must be raised up to the second power. And sure enough, we've created a polynomial with degree six here, right? The one here, the three here, and the two there. And you're like, so that's the answer? I'm done? No. The reason you're not done is there might be a constant out in front. And just by looking at the x-intercepts and the multiplicities, we don't figure out what that constant is. But to figure out that constant, you just use any other point on the graph, anything other than an x-intercept, and you can solve for that constant. One other point was given to me, right? This y-intercept tells me that when you put zero into this machine, 36 comes out. So what I can do is I can set the output to 36 and all of the inputs to zero. Zero plus two is just two. Zero plus one is one. And zero minus three is negative three. And I can solve this equation for a. All right, this is what, two times one times nine is 18. I get 36 is equal to 18a. So a is equal to two if you divide both sides by 18. So what that tells me is that my polynomial here, playing the role of the A, is the number two. I guess you could leave it like this if you really wanted to, but maybe it's not a bad idea to write a final answer somewhere. My polynomial is two times x plus two times x plus one cubed times x minus three squared. And uh, that's the end of this problem, and I guess that would be the end of this quiz.